Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you from all parts of the world. Um, I will introduce here the webinar. So next. The technology and new logistic webinar. So previous slide, please. I am Jacqueline Surug. I am the immediate past vice president of FIP. I just finished my four years mandate last month and I am the chair of the FIP Technology Forum. I have a hospital pharmacist background and I am working in the Centre Hospitalier Georges Renaud in York, which is a 1,300 beds hospital in France. Next. So it's my pleasure to introduce this uh, technology and new logistic uh, disruption for a forced opportunity for community pharmacies. Um, it's true that we are presently living extraordinary times. Digital transformation is already there and accelerating all around us. This raises opportunities and hopes, but it also raises challenges and concerns. How can we cope with this situation as we are swept forward into the future. This is what the webinar is about. This is part of the discussions we have in our FIP technology forum and in the community pharmacy section, which are the two FIP constituencies supporting this webinar. This webinar is according to FIP development goal number 20, and it's also uh, aligned with the FIP one strategy, one FIP strategy. Before handing over to, um, to uh, Lars Oke, okay, who will uh, present the program, let me go in the next slide through some announcements. First of all, I want to uh, present our moderators. Uh, Lars Oke Söderlum, immediate past president of the community pharmacy section and newly elected FIP vice president. Best wishes, Lars Oke. Uh, you are also FIP executive, uh, sorry, executive director uh, of Apotheket in Sweden. And uh, Charlotte, Charlotte Rossing, you are the vice chair of FIP Special Interest Group Pharmacy Practice and Research. You are director of research and development in Pharmacon in Denmark. And you are also a member of the FIP uh, Technology uh, uh, Committee. Some announcements. The webinar is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube. The recording will be available on our website after the session. You may ask questions using the letter box, the question box, which is provided. You are also welcome to provide feedback. Uh, you have the link here for the feedback. Feedback is important for us. It allows us to improve our webinar. And if you are not yet a member of FIP, please consider to join us and register. You got the link here and we will be happy to welcome you in the FIP family. Last, um, there will be a certificate of attendance for all the attendees of this session. So I will uh, end it to, to last. Now, Lars OK, uh, for the presentation of the webinar, the program of the webinar. Thank you so very much, Jacqueline, and thank you for that kind introduction. As Jacqueline mentioned, I'm here today with my colleague Charlotte Rossing from Denmark. But before I hand over to Charlotte, 
Uh, let me just uh, also give some introductionary words. Uh, I have been working my entire career with the Swedish healthcare sector, as well as with health systems abroad in improving health and creating a sustainable healthcare system uh, by integrating community pharmacy into primary healthcare. And I am passionate about pharmacy, the future, innovations and digitalization, and of course, the patient experience. I have also been vice president of the Swedish Pharmaceutical Society for many years and also had a number of executive positions within Apotheket. I was also president for the Swedish national project Check My Medicines for a number of years, a project which has significantly improved the therapy and outcomes for thousands of elderly in Sweden. As uh, Jacqueline mentioned, new niche and digital actors, as well as online pharmacies are entering the pharmacy market constantly, and healthcare is becoming more and more digital, and the development is partly exponential and partly driven by consumers as well. As such, there is a consumerism of healthcare. And also new logistic models in the pharmaceutical supply chains are being developed. And how will this affect the patients, the current pharmacy model and the healthcare systems? And furthermore, technology is reshaping the relationship between patient healthcare providers and the health system. And of course, mobile will play a crucial role as it has become the patient's constant companion 24 seven, which has been also very evident during the pandemic. So what impact will this have on community pharmacy? Is it a disruption of the pharmacy market or a forced opportunity for community pharmacy? So today we are going to learn more about the changing healthcare landscape, the new normal, the Amazonification of pharmacy. Is it a disruption or a forced opportunity for community pharmacy? What could happen? And how can independent pharmacies compete with the internet colossus? And what about the future of community pharmacy in the new normal from an FIP perspective? And finally, at the end, we will have a panel discussion with all the speakers. And we are delighted to have you all with us today. And of course, together with our global experts to learn more about technology and new logistics, a disruption or a forced opportunity for community pharmacies. Now over to you, Charlotte. Thank you very much, Lars, and thank you for the kind words and uh, for the opportunity to be in this webinar. My name is Charlotte Werner Rossing. I'm from Denmark. <clears throat> I've been in community pharmacy practice research uh, since uh, 2000, and I did a PhD back in those days where that was the new technology uh, on pharmaceutical care in Denmark. Um, I'm currently at a position at the Danish College of Pharmacy Practice at Pharmacon, where we are working with the development of um, services and uh, assisting the counseling and the daily work in the pharmacies so that the, all the Danish community pharmacies get evidence-based uh, practice models. Uh, I've been doing this for many, many years, and I have been very fortunate to work with uh, Lars and Jacqueline uh, over, the, over the years also, because in Denmark, we believe that international network is crucial. FIP has always been a very important platform for us to be at, uh, and also uh, PCNE, the Pharmaceutical Care Network Europe. So that's just a few words of me. And yes, then uh, a few years back, I was very fortunate to be um, to be fellow of uh, FIP, which I, I I bear in my heart, uh, and I'm very grateful uh, for. So just to say a few words on the learning objectives. Uh, by the end of today, uh, this event, uh, we would like that the participant understand the changing landscape of healthcare and pharmacy, identify how new actors use technology to sort of transform pharmacy services, because this is a huge thing that will probably uh, totally uh, uh, make a different daily work for, for many of us. Understand how digital transformation and tools support new business models and services, uh, as well as shaping the new patient and consumer behavior. So it's not only within the pharmacy, but it's also the demand from outside. Describe how FIP's uh, strategy and the Development goals can be used to transform pharmacy practice. And finally, define the strategy to, to transform pharmacy linked to the new normal. 
We have put together a panel of speakers, uh, like last said just a few minutes ago, and I'm very happy to introduce the first speaker. That is Carl Schneider. He's from he's a senior lecturer in pharmacy practice at the University of Sydney School of Pharmacy. Um, Carl is a research ex has research expertise in optimizing the patient safety via quality use of medicines with research output spanning pharmacoepi to implementation of healthcare services in Australia, Australian community pharmacies through development and implementation of practice guidelines. Carl completed his PhD in 2011 at the University of Western Australia and has and now has uh, over 30 career career total publications, primarily, primarily in the areas of health professional education, social and administrative pharmacy and implementation of healthcare services um, and has uh, a very good uh, hit rate on uh, getting funds also. So Carl, welcome and please uh, share your thoughts on this very important topic. Thank you so much for that introduction, Charlotte, and thank you so much for the invitation to talk to you today. It's a great privilege to speak with you, and I've been enjoying hearing or seeing in the chat where everybody has uh, coming from today. I see uh, spanning the world, Europe, Africa, uh, South America, Asia, and if you haven't already, please put in the chat to say hi and where you're from because it's great to see such an international audience today. Next slide, please. So uh, when we think about the idea of digitalization, there's the common expression that this is effectively the fourth industrial revolution, that it will revolutionize not just pharmacy, the way pharmacy practice, it will revolutionize the way work is conducted around the world. We know what disruption is. We are living in a time of disruption during the COVID-19 pandemic. We all have been practicing pharmacy or pharmaceutical science during this time, and we've had to rapidly adapt, adjust the way in which we practice. And we've had to demonstrate resilience in how we do this. Likewise, for digitalization, digital disruption refers to the changes enabled by digital technologies that occur in a speed and scale that transfer established ways of value creation, social interactions, doing business, and even how we think. And this picture for me is how I feel sometimes about how disruption can occur and how we withstand the storm. Next slide. So when I was looking at, or as we do, uh, looking at what will happen in the future, we try to use that crystal ball to think about what could possibly happen. And uh, one recent uh, uh, blog, uh, and it's actually very, very similar to many others that I've read through, uh, when we look at these futurists and what is next for pharmacy or healthcare in particular, they talk about three key trends. Telehealth, and I think you'll be able to tell, so many of you in the audience will be able to tell me more about telehealth than I will be able to tell you. So many of us have had to rapidly adjust to the provision of healthcare virtually or online. Uh, this has happened in, here in Australia where over half of our pharmaceutical care, uh, episodes of care have been delivered online during the time of the pandemic. So this is very much here now and today, and this will not go away. The other two key trends is to consumerization, and the idea of artificial intelligence helping us to support our clinical decision-making. Next slide. So Deloitte in 2019 uh, delivered a position paper uh, on the future of pharmacy and looking at how disruption can lead to transformative opportunities and challenges. And they have a few... Uh, worthwhile messages for us here for our topic today. On the next slide, you'll see 
uh, a figure that I'd like to highlight. They talk about three potential disruptions to the pharmacy supply chain. The first is the idea of greater precision in therapy as a result of the growth of gene therapy, digital therapeutics, medical devices, even 3D printing uh, in the pharmacy. I'm involved in a project that is delivering a 3D uh, printed product to help uh, custom dosing of liquid medications. And this is something that will increasingly emerge uh, potentially to disrupt the way in which we provide uh, dosing of medicines currently. The second is the idea of uh, a automated delivery approach. Uh, this is the idea, we talk about Amazonification. This is the idea that we're going to be delivering same day uh, on demand uh, via bots or drones. So you will notify that you require delivery and it will be delivered. The third is the idea of the pharmacist's role evolving with the emergence of automation. This will allow pharmacy time to be shifted from uh, the idea of supply to virtual or physical care. And this will allow pharmacists to be the next generation of primary care providers. And we see the advocacy that FIP has uh, put towards this uh, in the FIP commitment to action on the WHO Astana Declaration. Finally, I'd like to talk about reimbursement, the way in which the model of pharmacy is uh, reimbursed. This uh, has been uh, discussed or there is the idea that it'll shift from a product base to a value-based model of reimbursement. And there, Deloitte is telling us that this may actually drive hyper-localization of care. And that's, I think, a very encouraging sign because that is what pharmacy, community pharmacy, does so well. Next slide, please. So here we have uh, various snapshots of the rise of the machines. We have automated dispensing. We have even... Uh, automated dispensing, not even in the pharmacy, where there is no human as part of the process of the actual supply in uh, between the consumer or the patient and the product. And finally, there is the idea of, as mentioned in the previous slide, of the on-demand automated delivery via drones, in this case, of medicines direct to the consumer. Next slide, please. We also talk about the development of increasing precision in how we deliver medication. This can occur in several different ways. It could lead to increased precision in being able to identify, diagnose, manage, or indeed predict and prevent disease. This can occur with the confluence or the combining of data from the health system and the data from the consumer. This can be biometric data. It could be social data. Uh, this data can allow us to develop prediction models and that potentially will allow us or drive us into the prediction and prevention of disease and increasing pharmacokinetic, pharmacogenomic, and use of precision dosing of medicines. Next slide. So how fast does this happen? Does it happen like that wave in the first picture? Well, if we go back to the start of last century, diffusion of innovation, diffusion of technology was quite slow. However, as you move towards the present day, we see a shorter and shorter span for the diffusion of technology. And we only expect that to decrease 
as we move into the current 21st century. So we expect this to occur, uh, changes to occur more and more rapidly. And we saw that during the pandemic over the last two years. Next slide. So what is driving uh, the uptake of these technologies? Well, it's consumer preferences or consumer demand. If we look even in the span of four years in the United States, we see significant changes in the electronic uh, refills of uh, prescriptions, this on-demand digital refill. We see reminders or automated reminders uh, preferences increase. We see the increase in desire for to communicate with your healthcare provider through email or digital services. We also see uh, the digitalization on demand booking, changing, canceling appointments. Finally, there's the increased desire to use remote or telemonitoring services. And I mentioned earlier, this personal digital data, and that can be combined with health data in future. And finally, the idea, well, that's 49% in 2019. I suspect that's much higher in 2021 post COVID pandemic, communicating with your provider through video conferencing. Next slide, please. So what is this? consumerization of healthcare, change shifting our concept of patients to consumers. So this report by Adobe uh, recently uh, in 2020 uh, has some lessons for us. Next slide. We see that medical questions get answered online. If we look now, we're seeing in this sample from the United States, we see over 80% of uh, patients or consumers will research every diagnosis online. They're getting their information from the internet. Likewise, they will go online, the majority, perhaps not the uh, people over the age of 55, but the digital natives are going online for answers first thing when experiencing a symptom. They are doing this for self-diagnosis. Dr. Google, we often call it. Next slide, please. If we look at how consumers find a healthcare provider, when searching for new healthcare providers, consumers go online to a large extent. Your web presence as a community pharmacy is vital. Your digital footprint is vital for uh, helping consumers find your community pharmacy or your healthcare provider. Uh, in the United States, they also will use sites other than their insurance carrier. So they'll go beyond the funding model in which their healthcare is provided. Next slide, please. And uh, Adi will talk a, lot, a little bit more about this in presentation three. But if we look at what consumers value, they are... Uh, most of them, or in, for, in this case, 45%, the most important reason cited for a drop in healthcare provider loyalty is the service. Uh, and that is more important than the relationship. So they're becoming increasingly transactional. They're increasingly becoming um, in, interested in how a product is provided, how the service is provided. Do I get quick appointments, easy access? They're interested in cost or price, and they're also interested in time, uh, efficiency of time. So this is the, these ideas is how we can define consumerization. Next slide, please. The challenge is that not everybody is in the same boat. We are looking at multiple markets. Different people respond or will interact in different ways. If we look at this data from, again, the United States, we see that although a large proportion of the uh, consumer base across the ages will have some form of cell phone or mobile phone, 
this is much lower if we look at these phones where they have internet access. So there is a large proportion that still do not have access to uh, digital technology. And is, this is not in the United States alone. If we go to the next slide, we have here a selection of countries, some of I think may have been mentioned today. We see a differentiation of access, mobile access to the internet. So although United States we talked about today is near one end of the spectrum in terms of uh, the percentage of adults who own a smartphone that can access the internet online um, in a mobile fashion, we see this much lower in other countries, especially in countries uh, with a lower GDP. Next slide. So is it going to be like a wave? Well, it, we could talk about being a bit like a wave, but it's not going to be all consuming. This is the idea of the hype cycle. We're going to hear a lot about all these different technologies and the hype will increase. And there's this huge technological trigger due to these technologies resulting in this peak of inflated expectations. But then as they don't transition to or get implemented or become ubiquitous in practice, there becomes some disillusionment. And then gradually we see this start becoming implemented and result in a plateau of productivity. And I think this is best characterized by the words of Bill Gates on the next slide. We always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years. This is the hype. But we underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. So do not let yourself be lulled into inaction. Thank you very much and back to you. Thank you so very much, Carl, for this interesting introduction to the changing healthcare landscape, and not only healthcare, but also how patients and consumers actually drive the development. And of course, this is affecting, as you say, healthcare, patients, treatments, delivery of medicines, as well as the role of the pharmacist, and also the trend in shift to value-based care and new reimbursement models. Thank you so very much. It is now my great pleasure and honor to introduce the second speaker, Dr. Kenneth Hochmeyer. Kenneth Hochmeyer uh, is a PharmD and Associate Professor and Director of Community Affairs in the Department of Clinical Pharmacy and Translational Sciences at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Dr. Hochmeyer has an extensive background in community pharmacy practice and practice-based and implementation science research, including postgraduate residency training in community pharmacy, credentials in Lean Six Sigma and change leadership and attending the University of Pennsylvania's Implementation Science Institute. His background also includes extensive leadership experience, both in practice and within professional organizations with past and current positions held at local, regional and national levels in USA, including the American Pharmacists Association and the Ohio Pharmacists Association. He has over 65 publications in peer reviewed journals and has ser served as project leader on 15 grant funded projects, most of which explore expanded roles of pharmacy technicians and pharmacists in the community pharmacy to increase, increase patient care activities, such as vaccinations, medication, therapy management, and other clinical services. Welcome, Kenneth, to give us your presentation on the Amazonification of pharmacy, disruption or a forced opportunity. What could happen? Well, greetings and, and thank you for that introduction. Um, it, greetings from Nashville, Tennessee, by the way, which is where I'm, um, I'm speaking to all of you from. Uh, for those of you who don't know where Nashville is, we are Music City uh, in sort of the southeast of the United States. And um, uh, this is the start to my day where it's right now 5 a.m. in the morning. And uh, I just can't think of a better time or a better way to uh, start my day then uh, with all of you. So thanks for joining us today. It's really my pleasure to be here and, and to share some facts, but 
as our first speaker alluded to, also to attempt to look into the crystal ball and, and see a bit into the hazy future. And I, I think uh, the, the question posed by this webinar's title is, is really the, the right and, and the um, appropriate question to be asked today. Uh, that is namely, is, uh, is this true disruption or simply a forced opportunity? Because there is a difference and we'll, we'll chat about what that is over the next few minutes, uh, placing hopefully a lot of the hard data that our first presenter shared in, in context with, with Amazon as we go to the next slides here. So I, I would like to um, add a, a bit of context first, if you'll allow me uh, to, to venture away for a moment from pharmacy. And, and um, what we're gonna try to do is look at Amazon from the outside, uh, truly an industry behemoth with massive power, influence financial capital, uh, but is it different from what um, you know, what we're actually trying to do in, in pharmacy? And, and to illustrate, let's borrow from an industry we're all familiar with, which is entertainment. I think we can kind of share that across cultures and, and areas of, of the world. And, and so we begin our journey here with the, um, the VHS tape on the far left there. Hopefully that's not too unfamiliar to most of us. Uh, by itself, the VHS was not particularly impressive in terms of picture or sound quality. And in fact, in many ways, it was a step down from the movie theater, which we might say was the gold standard for the movie experience. Its true key innovation, however, was convenience, bringing the movie theater experience into your own house. Not much more than that. But then came the DVD, a true movie theater equivalent in terms of sound and picture quality an upgrade to the VHS experience. And then finally, on the far right-hand side, I think most of us can recognize without even reading the, the letters there, what, what that company is, and that's Netflix. Not a tape or a disc. In fact, this is not something you can own or borrow. It's a true departure from the status quo, true disruption. Payment models, supply chains, distribution channels, an entire industry upended by a simple company. Now, this is not to say that pharmacy will eventually be online only. That's not the point of, of this example. In fact, I'll give evidence that contradicts that commonly held belief quite a bit, that pharmacy is all heading online. Rather, my point is that Amazon Pharmacy represents uh, what it represents today, maybe more of a VHS to DVD shift rather than a DVD to Netflix disruption. And we'll talk through this some more in the coming slides. So let's look at the anatomy of what Amazon is and what Amazon Pharmacy is. It is a $1.8 trillion US company. To put that into some further context, that means it's number two on the Forbes 500 list. It's number 10 on the Forbes Global 2000 list. Amazon Pharmacy is a uh, new department within Amazon itself, a large retail giant. Amazon Pharmacy is really a combination of several existing business models. And that's what the core of Amazon Pharmacy is. It is a retail mail order pharmacy. It is a discount card program. And then lastly, it's a membership program. All three of these things have existed before, just maybe not in a combination and certainly not with the resources that back Amazon. Um, so you can read this and easily picture this famous scene from The Wizard of Oz, where we finally meet that wizard, uh, very big and scary, large green face, fires, flames, deep voice. But of course, do we really meet the wizard here? Is that really what we're seeing in this scene? And if we flip to the next slide, we'll see what's actually behind the curtain. And this is sort of my point. If we follow the Yellow Brick Road a bit further, we find the true wizard of Amazon. Still reliant on existing drug manufacturer wholesale pharmacy models. So distribution largely undisrupted. Same with the payment model. What we really see, the bulk of what Amazon Pharmacy is, is a really shiny mail order pharmacy. So uh, they will accept and have accepted and do accept uh, the, the typical third party reimbursement models that are, are very common in the US and, and abroad. Uh, things like uh, Medicare and Medicaid, which are our government payers for uh, the underserved and, and the elderly, and, and then, of course, employer-sponsored um, insurers as well. Uh, but, but that does not in itself disrupt the payment model. 
Uh, what we do see, though, is superior customer-centric platform with massive infrastructure for delivery. And so, again, here's where we tie into some of the information presented uh, in, the, in the first set of um, slides from our first speaker. And so let's continue to explore this a bit further into the next slide where we can talk about, all right, so we've got this information in front of us. What, what are we really looking at here then? Is this, is this the beginning of that disruption, that wave hitting the lighthouse? Is, is this just the status quo or is this something in between? And as I'll go into in the next slide, this is really going to be a combination of a, a few of these things. And, and so what I, I'd propose is what we're starting to see is, is a hybrid. I, I do believe that the argument that everything is going to online delivery is a bit uh, mis, uh, misleading and maybe a, a, a misreading of customer trends. First, regional and cultural consumer preferences vary and online healthcare uh, experience doesn't make sense for all populations and for all situations. For example, a sore throat perhaps uh, may be a good use of telehealth technology where uh, you need to see somebody quickly, you, you were not able to, to uh, take time uh, away from work maybe or had other obligations and uh, you just want a quick answer. But a serious diagnosis of a chronic condition what that's going to do is push an individual to want somebody that they know, that they trust, who they have established rapport with, right? So even within the same individual, same culture, same region, uh, different disease states uh, call for different types of health care. Um, second, there's a conflation between online and speed and convenience. There are a few industries, uh, there are really just few industries with such refined workflows as that which you can find in community pharmacy, where you can walk in the door and place an order and walk out within 15 to 30 minutes with that order being fulfilled. So we already have a very refined, very convenient, very speedy workflow process that I think uh, is a little bit different from what Amazon is used to disrupting in other retail sectors. Um, so, uh, you know, again, another, major advantage to a local brick and mortar pharmacy is, is this ability to use the workflow that already exists, to be able to use the expertise of the pharmacist to quickly resolve issues with medications or maybe uh, medication reimbursement, uh, to find solutions and fix those things, sometimes behind the scenes and, and sometimes right in front of the patient. And, and so I, don't, I, I think that may be underestimated as well. So what I believe uh, customer behavior and preference data points to is a future pharmacy model that is a hybrid status quo and disruption. Here are things that Amazon has either innovated or integrated uh, is now key convenience or customer experience features in its platforms. And so I think that's maybe what we're going to see spread through the pharmacy sector here is this idea that um, Amazon is really going to push up the quality um, rather than completely disrupt the entire industry. And we'll talk a little bit further about this on the next slide. So Amazon pharmacy argument has been really misdirected at pharmacy. Uh, I, I believe I'll, I'll put this argument forward uh, as well. Um, if you really dig into the trends and the data, you'll see that there's a shift towards convenient, uh, convenience demands in healthcare. This was again spoken about in the last presentation. Uh, however, pharmacy has been sort of constantly, consistently evolving for uh, probably about 100 years to keep up with customer demands and has already a very convenient pharmacy care model. So the overall experience could improve, you know, vis-a-vis -vis our VHS to DVD example. Um, we could improve, I think, that, that quality of, of customer centricity and, and customer experience, patient experience. But the accessibility and the convenience and the speed is likely pretty close to perfect at this point. Medicine, on the other hand, generally has much more ground to make up for, at least in the US. So I, I see actually that there is new consumer trends um, maybe more impactful on the medical care model than in the pharmacy care model. Uh, and um, for a little bit of, of um, uh, practical evidence to that, let's, let's turn to the next slide where we're going to see a, a few headlines from um, recent. I, I pulled these from actually October, uh, but you can find these sort of headlines all throughout 2021, um, where Amazon themselves continue to look at a, a retail, a brick and mortar um, 
uh, establishment or, or footprint. Um, so Amazon is, is, of course, likely looking at the same public data that we all are, are sort of gazing into, but I'm sure they have their own internal data as well. And, and what they're read from this is, is we still need a brick and mortar, a physical presence, a physical retail presence in communities across the country. And I think that that sort of uh, bodes very well for those of us who are in community pharmacy, uh, because it, I think it, what it does is evidence the things which we all know, which is that there's real value to having a, a clinician in the community um, who shares the values and, and beliefs and culture of that community. So with that, I will hand uh, things back over to the speaker and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kenneth, very much. It was very, very interesting. And I especially like the distinction between the, the distribution or the retail of medicines and the medicines management, including the services. So what will, what will support each other and what will actually work against it? I'm sure that we will have more discussion about this in the panel discussion. So thank you very much, Kenneth. And then I give <clears throat> the word now to Adi. Adi is a registered pharmacist and a PhD student, student studying pharmacist health information seeking behavior. Adi is a, has a passion for applying machine learning and deep learning methods uh, to transform healthcare and streamline healthcare processes. He teaches students an academic encoding language of Python and R and for data science and anal analysis. As a state coordinator, he, he also organizes training for pharmacy interns. His master work focused on marketing and the influence of service quality in community pharmacies. Uh, and as a part uh, of FRP, he is a member of the health uh, and medicines information section, uh, but also at the FIPTEC uh, forum where, where a few of us is there. So Adi, thank you very much. And uh, I welcome you to the floor and I'm looking forward to, to listen to your talk now. Thank you, uh, Charlotte, for that introduction. And uh, hi to everyone. Um, thank, uh, thank you for tuning in from all parts of the world. Um, I'm going to start, um, you know, in talking about how inter independent pharmacies compete with the Internet Colossus. Um, I'm going to tell in the next slide uh, the story of my friend Cam, who I've known for about 15 years. So Cam is also a pharmacist. That's not his real picture. Uh, he didn't let me use the real picture of him. That's just the stock image of a happy male pharmacist who, how, I, who I, how I've envisioned Cam to be. But Cam, as well as being a pharmacist, is also a pharmacy owner. He operates a traditional small model of pharmacy um, as an independent owner. And recently what's happened is a large warehouse style retailing pharmacy with a price focus has opened up in the neighboring suburb. This began eating his market share. So to differentiate himself, um, he began implementing new services and sort of making himself service focus. He wasn't seeing the returns on his investment that he was expecting. He thought he knew what service quality was. And that was the key thing to people would want, right? Service quality, making them also wanting to return. So on the next slide onwards, we're gonna look at what drives a customer to return to a pharmacy. Going on, we see one of the drivers of a customer's intention to return to a pharmacy is the service quality of the pharmacy. So Cam was right about in thinking about improving service quality in a way of returning or increasing his customer return. However, what does it mean by service quality? How do you, you know, conceptualize this term? Is it by having services? Is it by having knowledgeable staff? Is it by having friendly staff? Service quality can mean different things to different people. And it can also mean different things to pharmacists as well. So we decided to find out how do patients conceptualize service quality? At the end of the day, patients are the ones returning to the pharmacy and they're gonna to continue to hopefully make purchases with the pharmacy. So going on, we set out a few years ago to see how do customers you know, conceptualize this term service quality. And if, if this is different between big box um, price focused pharmacies and independent maybe service focused pharmacies. However, 
in both models, we saw that the way patients observe service quality was in regards to health and medicine advice, non-prescription service, relationship quality, the technical quality, the environmental quality, and health outcomes. Just a little note, not all big box pharmacies are price focused, just like not all service focused pharmacies are independent pharmacies. I use the term surface focused and price focused as sort of the marketing strategy of the pharmacy. But these strategies can be part of any design or group of pharmacies. So moving on, what do these elements of service quality mean? So the first is health and medicine advice, uh, which is the communication interaction between the pharmacy staff and the customer about their medicines or health. An example of health and medicine advice is the staff provide excellent information about how to properly use each prescription medicine. Non-prescription service is the next one, which covers the information uh, and assistance provided by staff in relation to non-prescription medicine. Now, this element is similar to health and medicine advice, but is focused on products or items not required with the physician's prescription. There is a relationship quality, which is sort of the interpersonal connections built between staff and the customer. And this is in relation to the interactions, uh, communication interactions and trust. So, so examples of this would be, I have developed a trusting relationship with the staff, or I sometimes kid, uh, kid around, laugh or joke like we are good friends. The fourth is technical quality, which is the staff's technical competence to perform tasks such as dispensing and store operations, operations, as well as their level of training and qualifications. So here, customers are confident about your technical expertise and the knowledge that you have as a pharmacist. It is commonly assumed that the pharmacist they are seeing is highly technically competent, unless something happens where they can no longer consider you or consider your technical quality as high. So the first four elements are human elements, whereas you know the this one here is environmental quality, is more about the atmosphere and physical environment of the store. This is the layout of the store, the feel, and how easy it is to find something. And finally, the last element is health outcome, where it is the pharmacy's impact on the customer's future or past health. In this final one, the patient believes that their health will improve by visiting your pharmacy. So keeping these six elements in mind, let's move on to the next part. So I introduced these drivers of customer behavior. Um, however, what we had saw were these were in your common brick and mortar pharmacy. In the current age with you know, COVID, many customers are hesitant to leave their homes or have to turn to shopping online. Yet, online shopping, even for pharmacy, is not a new concept, with many large groups operating in the online pharmacy space. As such, there are some learnings to be made from the success of these pharmacies. On the next slide, um, I present some pharmacy sales data. So I'm currently based in Australia, so I'll be presenting Australian statistics. And in 2021, so this year, the total pharmacy revenue sales was you know, 321 million compared to the total pharmacy industry, which is about 22 billion. So I give these numbers sort of as a comparison. But in, you know, in actual fact, some of the pharmacy sales revenue may be higher as pharmacy, Australian pharmacies don't actually have to report their earnings publicly. What I wanna focus is the breakdown of the sales and see what the range of items are. So we have the non-prescription medicines, such as your over-the-counter ibuprofen, aspirin or paracetamol, um, type, these are the types of items, or prescription-based items, such as your medicines for cholesterol control, diabetes, or antihypertensives. There are also cosmetics, vitamins, and other personal care items. We can see that customers are going to purchase um, though that are going to purchase are not only there for prescription items. They purchase many other products as well, most of which are readily available in a bricks and mortar pharmacy. As there are a range of products, think how these service quality elements can apply. Going forward, who are the customers of this space? Mostly middle-aged group followed by the younger group behind them. So why do I show this market segment? to think about who you might need to target and why. For example, the 35 to 54-year-olds year old, have a higher average disposable income 
meaning the average spend is higher. It commonly buy preventable healthcare products and premium cosmetics, fragrances, and personal care items. These factors contribute to this age's cohort strong position and, and as part of the why they're the largest market segment. The convenience of online shopping particularly appeals to this group as well. Therefore, some of you may have different clientele from a brick, brick and mortar store to an online pharmacy. It's not a bad thing, but may mean a different strategy is slightly needed. So let's look next at what makes these online pharmacies successful. The first uh, one is being able to have um, ability to control your stock on hand. Pharmacies operating in the online space must make sure they have sufficient control of stock to reduce inventory costs and be able to increase stock turnover. The next one is being able to have production of goods that are currently favored by the market. So depending on your target market, um, an online pharmacy, uh, so the, depending on the target market and online pharmacy products mix must be appropriate. So the products you carry you know, must be appropriate for your clientele. Consumers can be seeking value for um, value for money items. And as such, pharmacies must have stock of a range of products perceived as being of good value. The next uh, driver is being able to have prompt delivery to market. So this is a logistical component, which align with customers' desire for convenience. So online pharmacies have to be able to deliver goods promptly and safely. And this is often done through registered posts or couriers. Going on, another driver of success is the provision of superior after-sales service. So one way to obtain a competitive advantage is by offering free advice services and direct counseling from a pharmacist over the phone. Most pharmacies already perform this service inside their pharmacy, but for those not able to physically get to a pharmacy, there are ways to provide that pharmacist interaction. And finally, online pharmacies need an experienced workforce. This means having trained pharmacists and pharmacy assistants dispense prescription and prescription-only medicines. Not only and is this an ethical and legal requirement that we practice our duties promptly and safely, but by having a trained workforce ready to answer, uh, talk to customers helps in that extra level of service provision. So going on, we saw that drive uh, what drives an online pharmacy to be successful. And notice there is a little bit of overlap in the service quality elements. For example, your expertise and readily available products can be what customers are looking for. But if you're doing what already, already existing online stores are doing, we saw what their successes are, then what makes you different? So going on, think about in the next one, in the next slide, thinking about why not combine the service quality elements that your store is known for. And then this is, you know, this is what drives your customer to return to you. And then take these service quality elements and combine them with an online environment. Now, this is not a one-stop solution to everyone's whims and worries, but this is a possible way to think about operating the pharmacy. So everyone's situation is different and you need to do a specific strategy to your conditions. But there are some things to consider. You know, the first is an online presence. It is important to establish an online presence, knowing where are your customers? Are they on Facebook or are they on Instagram? Are they on social media at all? Do you have a website where people can purchase off you? I have another friend of, um, old friend of mine uh, who has her compounding pharmacy. So she makes uh, a lot of the prescriptions up and she uses Instagram for her online presence. To her success, she is now and purely online based and doesn't actually take in customers into a front of shop anymore. All her transactions, all her interactions, and all her promotions are now purely online and are going in an online manner. So making sure you have that online presence. So most of my friends, has her success, I would say, is using that online presence but marketing herself to her to get new customers. So now many, not many pharmacists are health professionals, you know, 
they're not inherently marketing gurus. Therefore, it might be necessary to get some marketing help to get your pharmacy out there. Have a disco- discoverable. Traditionally, we capture someone's attention as they may walk past the store or maybe have advertising and have them come in to make a purchase. How can we do that with an online presence? How do we get customers to be aware of us? As part of that marketing, it is knowing who you might target. You might have an elderly population that buys prescription medicines by coming into your pharmacy, but a younger population may buy other products online from you. You may have a client base that is interested in premium cosmetics. Knowing who you would target with your online presence, uh, with your online presence is important. Now think about the service quality elements. One of the elements was relationship quality. While communication may have nonverbal com- components, it doesn't mean that you cannot still interact with your patients. Simple things such as reminders or follow-up services and calls can help improve that relationship quality with your patients. You move away from being a business to a person they associate with and are more familiar with. How much more likely are they to prefer to purchase off you? Finally, as part of the relationship is our ability to provide advice and information to patients regarding their health. Addressing their health outcomes, patients want to know that by contacting you, their health can improve. These are some elements to consider to ensure that like your business can thrive and compete and that you're not being left behind. Thank you for listening. I'll um, pass it back on to the moderators. Thank you so much, Ardi, for introducing the concept of service quality and, of course, combining it also with online presence. This is also closely linked to trust, and trust is a central part of all human relationships and, you can say, a fundamental element of social capital as well. And it's also essential to healthcare because there is a significant association between trust in healthcare professionals and pharmacy and health outcomes for the patients. So with a strong competition growing in almost every space, there is a moment to remind us all once again of the importance of listening closely to what our customers and patients want and transforming our offer and providing our patients with an unparalleled pharmacy health and well-being experience. And in this way, we will continue to be successful demonstrating our value and how pharmacy and pharmacists will be even more at the center of the healthcare system and by this paving the way for a stronger future. Thank you so very much. It is now my great honor and pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Catherine Duggan, CEO of FIP. Dr. Duggan is the Chief Executive Officer of the International Pharmaceutical Federation and is responsible for the visionary leadership, support, development, advocacy, and growth across the 150 member organizations and the 4 million members FIP represents. Until April 2018, Dr. Duggan was the Director of Professional Development at the Royal Pharmaceutical Society of UK or Great Britain, where she was responsible for the delivery of professional advice and support to all members across all sectors, the development of strategies to share and showcase good practice across the profession, and the development and implementation of professional standards for pharmacy. From 2012, Catherine led the development, implementation, and strategic embedding of RPS faculty and foundation programs into continuing professional development. Dr. Duggan has published widely and presented at national and international meetings and has a wealth of people and program management experience. She is recognized leader across the profession, working with many networks within and across the profession and more widely health and business. Catherine has worked in community primary care, hospital and academia. And between 2007 and 2009, Catherine was the chair of the United Kingdom Clinical Pharmacy Association and then elected member of the council of the RPSGP. 
Dr. Duggan has received several prestigious awards and lately awarded the Nagai International Woman Scientist Award 2021 on behalf of the Academy of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Technology in Japan. Welcome, Catherine, to give us your presentation on the future of community pharmacy in the new normal. Well, thank you so much, Lars. What an honor to be here today. Thanks to you, Jacqueline and Charlotte, and to the speakers who have gone before me, Carl, Kenneth and Ardy. And a special thanks to the team behind the scenes. Let's not forget that um, we're all working in a digital way these days, using virtual uh, platforms and technology to enable us to be together. So, I wanted just to provide you with some reflections before we start the panel conversation. Um, what's really important for us is to remember that digital health and digital um, developments and technology can enhance everything we do. It's a fundamental issue for FIP and we really need to think about how we embrace it. And our speakers today have really provided us with the best kind of background to have our discussions and develop a plan. Actually, when you think about it, um, we have got one development goal committed to digital health, but many others uh, influence and impact digital health, including policy development, um, uh, impact measures, evidence and data. How do we collect the impact of the effects of digital health on our practices and the effect of our practices using digital health uh, for benefit? Now, I would say to my colleagues on the call that digital health and technology not only impacts community pharmacy, but actually it's a good lens to look through. Remembering that community pharmacy is the first port of call for our profession and for our patients and our uh, populations, then we can start to think about how we embrace and enhance and capture the benefits of digital whilst we undertake the uh, a mitigation against some of the risks that we might see. I want to just provide a couple of other um, reflections for us. What I think we need to do as a profession is to identify the challenges, the threats, some of the fears that we may have about a complete move to digital. And then to also identify the opportunities and the positives, which we've heard um, some of today. We should remember that no profession would ever advocate a full swing to either only digital or only face-to-face. -face. And telehealth has shown how we can use technology to enhance what we do face-to-face. -face. Uh, additionally, colleagues, everything the profession has done during COVID has shown the benefit of remaining open and accessible and providing a face-to-face. -face. So digital should be used as an enhancement. Another point I wanted to mention to my colleagues is that everything we do in pharmacy is technological, from medicines, formulations, devices, supply chain, genomics. That's just to name a few. Everything we do is based on technology, but because we've become used to them or because we've become uh, embedded within those systems, we often take them for granted as technological advancements. And we should do the same with any kind of digital health uh, innovation. As the profession that is essential to safe, effective, appropriate access to medicines, I would say we need to take from our experts today and build on our strengths as a profession. We're very, very good at developing plans that identify the risks, the benefits and the mitigations. But colleagues, one place I know that FIP can help the profession is where we uh, come to advocate for ourselves. We're not very good as a profession at blowing our own trumpet or um, pushing ourselves forward, so to speak. So if we use examples that we've uh, seen during the pandemic of how we've used not only technology, uh, but we've also used uh, bricks and mortar and a face-to-face -face, uh, engagement with our patients and the public, we can ensure that pharmacy is seen as essential to the technology and digital advances we see. I would say colleagues that we need to campaign and advocate. We need to provide our profession with toolkits and evidence so that the ministries in all of our countries understand the fundamental role that community pharmacy plays in communities and the enhanced role that digital health can provide them with to deal with the new normal, to deal with the new challenges 
to deal with the existing um, pandemic and to deal with the iceberg of needs that that will result in. So colleagues, I think this is my reflections to date and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, uh, Catherine. Um, Jacqueline, uh, what's next on the agenda? Thank you very much, uh, all of you. I think now we are turning to the uh, uh, discussion panel um, to answer the Q&A, the questions in the Q&A box. I think there are some uh, already some questions which are raised and we are happy to have our panelists, um, um, Carl, Kenneth, Hardy, Catherine, Lars Oke, and Charlotte together to answer the questions. So I think we, are, you have, we have a first question. Uh, Lars Oke, shall I hand it to you? Yes, thank you so very much. Uh, and this is um, a question I think uh, Kenneth perhaps can answer. Could Amazon, use the concept successfully used within books, music, household appliances, etc., to start to conquer the pharmacy market by easy reach customers, like those buying OTC products, then scaling up their activities towards patients uh, suffering from NCDs. And in the end, eventually uh, specialty products offering low prices, convenience, etc. How do you think that um, community pharmacy should and can compete with uh, this approach? Yeah, thank you so much, Lars. And, and thanks for that question as well. I, I think it's a very important one. Um, there's a, a piece of the premise of that, that question I might push back on if I can. And that would be that, um, when we're looking at over-the-counter sales and retail sales of things that are not prescription-related, healthcare-related in, in that capacity, I, I think um, you're looking really at two different uh, customer segments, or in some ways, you're looking at two different service offerings. I, I, I see the linkage because we're used to seeing OTCs sold in combination with prescription products in most brick-and-mortar community pharmacies. But I think the individual who's going online to buy OTCs from, and, and the data I think bears this out, OTCs from Amazon is not the same individual who is um, maybe rushing over to the pharmacy to drop off their pediatric antibiotic prescription and have that sort of filled in front of them right then and then asking the questions importantly to their community pharmacist. I think that's the, that's the vision your question is really the vision that Amazon is backing. And I think it's the one that's been told a lot in the press and in, in the lay media. But I, I think there's, um, there's a lot of steps that are, are being overlooked in, in transitioning from one to the other, the OTC retail sales all the way over to sort of dominating the prescription service piece of, of all of this. There, there was, and not to not to plug um, any of my own um, publications, but for just a moment, if I could, I'll, I'll reference a, a publication that myself and a few colleagues had in the American Journal of Managed Care this past month on Amazon. Um, one of the things I reference in that in that uh, commentary is the idea of um, the fact that consumers are looking for uh, multiple things within a product, not just the product itself, but how it meets some social needs, how it meets um, uh, many other needs. So I, I would just, to not, not take too much of the microphone time, I would reference that article because what, what I think we're getting at here is, is that um, it, it's not just one thing. Pharmacy is not just one thing. And, and what this digital trend may, may show us um, is what pieces the, the uh, consumer values in the brick and mortar community pharmacy versus what they value really being an online service oriented product. And, and there probably are differences there. We may see the front end of a community pharmacy shrink in fact, um, but I think it would also be maybe the, the, the back end, the pharmacy itself that may expand as more services go into that pharmacy itself. So thanks for that question. Thank you so very much, Kenneth, very interesting answer. Um, uh, Catherine, do you think that pharmacy has to become a health center supplementing traditional pharmacy 
uh, health, uh, primary healthcare centers and uh, what are sort of the tools in order to succeed uh, in this uh, transformation? Well, I think Lars, I'm going to I'm going to give the most awkward of answers to that question, which is it depends on the needs of that community, and we know that successful health provision, successful primary healthcare access and provision, and indeed successful business, is found where we are responsive to need. So I would say that if you look at the needs of a community and think about the primary healthcare services that can be delivered in that area and then how pharmacy can enhance and add value and can be seen as essential. That's where pharmacy uh, has the greatest success. And that could be about um, maybe engaging other health professionals in services in the pharmacy or directing patients where they can get other services. I'm thinking for diabetic patients, maybe having chiropody nearby or podiatry nearby or in the pharmacy, for example, just thinking innovatively like this, but maybe also to have the idea that the pharmacy would be the port of call and then could provide follow-up um, domiciliary services, not only by visiting patients in their homes, but also through telehealth as well. So my answer is, is, is vague in the fact that I think it needs to be needs based, but specific in the fact that I think once you have that menu of responsive services, you will be fundamental to that community. Lars, we're doing a big piece of work here at FIP to track and monitor what FIP has done every 100 days during the pandemic since the 30th of January. A bit of a, a bit of a, a celebration of what the profession has done, not a not a review of what hasn't gone so well just in this year. Everybody is quite tired and fatigued, so we need a, a positive, uplifting piece. But can you imagine the lessons learned from the way in which the profession has responded in each country, based on the needs of that country, which may have differences, may have commonalities, may provide us with the roadmap of how we become fundamental, central and absolutely essential in our communities following the pandemic. So we use this moment of crisis for the globe to really embed ourselves in our communities and triage out to other professions, you know, other parts of the profession as well. How can the hospital sector be communicating with the community sector and vice versa as well? Because that's absolutely fundamental. Thanks Lars. Thank you so very much, Catherine. Yes, uh, I agree with you because the commitment of the pharmacy profession to patient care and the hard work and determination to sustain medicine supply and key pharmaceutical care services throughout the pandemic has been uh, a source of immense pride as well. And I think it's important now that these positive changes to patient care and pharmacy practice in response to COVID-19 are retained and built upon, we must continue to improve patient experience whilst protecting the future sustainability of our uh, different health systems, I think. But you mentioned triage, and I would like to raise a question to Carl. What about triage in the digital world? How could it work? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, so, the elements of triage require, first of all, uh, contact or whether it be digital, virtual or air face to face. And I think community pharmacy has demonstrated its value in being the most accessible healthcare providers in many nations across the world. And so they are well placed, uh, especially even indeed during the pandemic, we saw that uh, consumers or patients would come to pharmacies to be triaged, whether they should take or buy or purchase COVID tests. Uh, and that is a role that pharmacists were playing. So first of all is that contact. And that can also be done in an online fashion. And that can be done through telehealth and increasingly so through telehealth. The second thing is, is the clinical decision-making, whether you need to transfer this uh, person or can it be handled uh, then and there. So that is, I think, a very interesting question. Uh, I won't go too much into detail, but that's where potentially we can see the benefit of artificial intelligence starting to become more and more 
part of our arsenal in providing care, pharmaceutical care to the public. And online is a tremendous uh, opportunity for pharmacy to provide that clinical decision-making triage. Finally, then there needs to be communication. Once you've made a decision for triage or referral, there needs to be some communication process. And I think online also provides an opportunity to facilitate. One of the traditional barriers for us in community pharmacy in face-to-face -face triage is that final connection to the next step, whether it be a general practitioner, physician, medical, or indeed allied health, or indeed emergency care. That final step is a barrier that can be overcome through telehealth or online, which can uh, facilitate seamless transition of care. So I think that there is an opportunity there for enhanced triage through an online platform. Thank you so very much, Carl. And of course, it has a huge impact as well if we consider all the rural areas where uh, technology actually will give uh, much more faster access for the patients uh, with different uh, healthcare providers like the physician, nurse, and the pharmacist. I now have a question for Ardi. Um, we often talk about the different uh, stages of revolution. We have talked about the fourth industrial revolution, and now we're looking into the fifth industrial revolution. And if we uh, think about a mindset shift uh, from customer or patient or consumer relationship management to consumer or patient manage relationships. Could you elaborate a little bit on that, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think I think having to have this mind shift change um, can be a bit of a hard step for many people to think about. You know, there are things that we've done traditionally and how we've maybe interacted with our patients, how, how we've had our relationships with our patients in a certain traditional way. But now realizing that, you know, we've come to a new age or we are transforming into a new age, how do my relationships change with my patients? And I think, I think one of the things that was interesting for me and I'll say maybe personal experience is um, during the COVID-19 like, pandemic and with lockdowns, a lot of my relationships with my patients had to change where I, a lot of them I couldn't physically see. A lot of times when I was in the pharmacy, um, my my whole work with a lot of them was all you know over the phone or telehealth or even trying to do a lot of the um, our interactions in a new means. And I think when it comes to being able to make that transition as a pharmacist, we should be if we are having a reactive um, persona or reactive mindset that change and that shift is a bit harder for us to adjust or use, get used to. But if we go to a proactive type change and having to see opportunities where they can be presented, um, I feel like that shift that you were saying that we're going into this new type of revolution, uh, evolution is a bit easier to manage and work with and actually progress ourselves in a better way as pharmacists or even healthcare providers. Um, and it's, it's probably not a concept I could probably <laughs> address in like a minute or two. Um, but I, I think that's that part of that whole being able to be able to change is having that proactive approach rather than reactive of approach. If it might help. Thank you so very much, Ardi. Yes, I agree with you. And I also think that um, um, the next step in the industrial evolution, the fifth one will be much more about personalization. Uh, and uh, perhaps the strategic differentiator will be uh, lifelong partnerships uh, and the customer or patient well-being and quality of life. Uh, so uh, what you mentioned in your presentation about uh, quality is uh, actually very important to have in mind when we look at the future as well.
We have another question here, um, and uh, I don't know really uh, which one of you can answer it, but can you suggest a framework suitable to evaluate digital health technologies and applicability in pharmacy? So how can pharmacies actually uh, evaluate the different technologies and, and choose the right one? Is it your call or I'll, Kenneth? I'll answer, I'll answer the first half, but then I think I might throw over to Kenneth for the second half. I think the first half is very much, you could use a traditional health technology assessment framework. Uh, it can be applicable to digital technology as well as uh, physical tangible objects that provide healthcare. But then you, the second part of your question is applicability to pharmacy. And that starts becoming important uh, when you consider context and implementation. So that's why I want to hand across the Kenneth. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. And um, if I may, Lars, would you mind uh, repeating the last uh, part of that question so I answer it uh, correctly? Well, it was uh, about the digital health technologies and applicability in pharmacy. So how can pharmacies actually evaluate um, uh, the, digit, the different the technologies and choose the right one for their uh, operations. Okay, so that um, I 100 percent agree with Carl on the implementation aspect of, of this. So there, there's a piece of this which is, is going to um, relate to scaffolding um, where you know for, for somebody who's, who's on this webinar who is right now practicing a community pharmacy or maybe owns a community pharmacy, for you to move from where you are today to what Amazon is offering um, or what some of the medical practices in your country is offering, um, that, that may not be practical. Um, so the question is, what is your next proximal step on the scaffolding, which will get you closer to the experience which Amazon uh, may have? So I think that's, that's one piece, and that gets to the feasibility of implementation. I think the other piece is really understanding, which again is, is our value as community pharmacists, is really understanding what your local consumer base, what your local patient base is most interested in, what, what they find value in, and then really focusing on, <clears throat> on um, pushing the implementation of, of that piece of technology. So for example, uh, ordering online a refill um, or an OTC product may not be something that your local community cares much about, but scheduling vaccine visits may be. And, and so, you know, it's not worth you putting all of your resources into developing both of those two items if your consumers only want one. Amazon and those that like Amazon have to do it all because they're trying to hit everywhere at all, all times. Um, but I think we can be a little bit more strategic and smart about how we advance technology. And I'll give an example. Um, we work with a, a regional pharmacy chain, um, regional, national. Um, they have 2,400 pharmacies across the U.S. in most regions, except for the East Coast and West Coast. So mostly the Midwest, uh, West and Southeast of the United States. Um, and like most pharmacies in the U.S., not very tech savvy. Uh, but um, we have several vaccines now which pharmacists can administer, which require a initial dose and then a booster. This is pre-COVID that we, we worked on this project. And um, what, what pharmacists had been doing in their workflow was integrating adherence interventions, which were reimbursable and had been uh, um, implementing that over the last five years, where it would, it would drop in their queue to give a call to the patient, or if the patient stopped by the counter to intervene with that patient on the adherence intervention. What we basically did was we built a vaccine reminder into that same queue. So using all the workflow that already existed, using processes that already existed. Um, and then we also layered in a text messaging alert in a sort of if this, then that logic. So um, we would basically remind the patient uh, via text message that they were due for their booster. And so if they were in the grocery store by the pharmacy, they would notice swing by. And also the pharmacist from a different angle would say, well, if they're here to pick up this hypertensive medication, we'll also remind them about their vaccine because it dropped into the same queue that they were used to. Now, we didn't jump right into you know, order tracking. We didn't uh, go right into some of these other really neat uh, tech services. We, we started very simply with something that we thought would be feasible, and it turned out it was. And so now we've moved to that proximal step. We're ready for the next one in the years to come. 
Thank you so very much. Very interesting. Uh, and um, actually, uh, we used to say that patients don't care uh, how much you know until you show how much you care. So I think this is a, an excellent way of empowering the pharmacy profession to transform patient care and also show that we really care. Excellent. I will now turn over to uh, Jacqueline and Charlotte. I guess you also have... Uh, some questions for the panelists? Yes, indeed. I was thinking, um, first of all, thank you for all the very good presentations. I, I was thinking of the angle of view from the patient. Uh, are there some uh, pitfalls that uh, the patient should be aware of in this new normal world? So this is my question. You can start that, Jacqueline. I think, um, I think we use the word trust because we know what we want um, to instill in our patients and the public. But we also know that people can be very mistrustful and they can be too trustful. So I think there's something here about um, supporting our patients to understand the importance of their data and all the medicines data that may be held in these new digital platforms and clouds and, you know, or these ethereal places where data may be held and shared, and to really empower them about what could be shared and what couldn't be shared. Now, I don't know about all of you. Um, I do know colleagues uh, in Sydney have just been set free from 107 days of, of uh, lockdown. But those of us that have been experiencing a bit of what we might call freedom, we're also faced with sharing an awful lot of data in order to be able to travel or to be able to access what we would have considered normality prior to COVID. And I think it's worth us all just having that moment to reflect on um, safe practices and making sure our profession can be seen as a steward of safe data um, capture, safe data holding. And, you know, Jacqueline, as patients give us the data that we need to be able to ensure their safe medicines, I think we need to be returning that in kind and making sure they can trust us by having self safe systems in the way in which we share and handle data. I really like the idea, Carl, you mentioned between hospital and community. It reminds me of way back last century research I was involved in, and we used to do it by paper. We used to take paper uh, between our health systems. And what I'm also seeing now is that you can have the digital data, but you can also print things off as well. And perhaps if some people are more confident with that, pharmacy can be that interface across our health systems and sectors. So I think, Jacqueline, for us, we've got a, an opportunity to enhance the trust the public hold us in if we're a little bit au fait with uh, data privacy. Thank and you. If, if I may. Yeah, please, please, Kenneth. I, and only a short comment off of, off of Catherine's. I think accessibility here is gonna be another thing we have to pay attention to because not all consumers, especially the elderly that we take care of may want to use the um, technology that exists and that is exciting for, um, for us as a profession. And so things like paper um, and, and other options beyond digital, I think are gonna be very important for some of our uh, consumer base. Yes. Can I just add one more thing? Uh, uh, to add to that, we as healthcare providers uh, traditionally consider health literacy in the way in which we communicate with our uh, patients. Now we need to add to that the concept of digital literacy as a way in which we communicate with our patients. And that creates differentiation. And I think I mentioned earlier that this differentiation, we need to uh, re recognize that needs are going to differentiate. So we need to uh, move into a customization of our care delivery. We, one size will no longer fit all. Absolutely. I think uh, digital literacy for patients is key. We cannot go forward without trying to leverage the literacy of our patients. And this is a very, very hard task. I see in my country, for instance, we have patients, old patients in their very, in the middle of nowhere, there is no literacy for them, no digital literacy. So it's, it's 
it's really a very, very, very hard task. I think it will be easier for the new generation, which are coming in the future, but there is just a, a very huge part of the population which will not be able to benefit on, on digital technology. It, it is, uh, I think we must admit that, that it is too hard to leverage everybody. So I think the literacy is key. Um, I'm turning to Charlotte. Is, is Charlotte, well, and to Lars, okay. Charlotte, did, did yes. you like Thank yeah. you. I don't know whether there's time for just one more question, so question, or if we should finish that. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Just a few minutes overdraw is okay. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, it's to the panel and actually going on like uh, proceeding on, on this note uh, that you just had, because I, 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 I found it very inspirational what you've been talking about and it, the different kind of uh, abilities and inabilities with the patients and the in the local areas are, are of course very important. So just uh, to the panel to close this off, uh, what would be the skills for the practitioners in the future? Because it's obvious there's a lot of technology in this, but there's, it, do you think there's more? Will it be the same to meet the customers online as it is offline? So what about post and pre-graduate training in the future? How should we include this? A small question at the end. <laughs> I, I can attempt to answer that uh, to begin with. I'll, I'll lean on the fact that like many things in pharmacy, uh, we have to be very good delegators. And so I, I think we need to uh, be thinking about how do we train pharmacists to work with others to create a, a healthy digital presence that is inclusive. Um, thank you. I'd like to briefly say that uh, I know this sounds trite, but keep doing what we already are doing. We have demonstrated such agility in our response, a resilience in our response to the pandemic. This demonstrates that we are able to adapt in an agile fashion. And so, and Kenneth has suggested through his talk, uh, and I have as well, that there will be an ongoing need for hyperlocalization, ongoing bricks and mortar presence. So keep doing what we do so well. I think the, the statement that the forum, technology forum, as uh, proposed, uh, includes um, uh, some some items on the uh, um, on the specialization or knowledge for digital literacy, and we even uh, proposed that this uh, knowledge should be shared with the other healthcare professionals medical doctors and nurses and all healthcare professionals, because we are for the patient on the same boat. As I always say, we should work hand in hand. And uh, I think the literacy, digital literacy for pharmacists will be uh, very similar to digital literacy for medical doctor, for instance, and for nurses. So we should all work together to have a sort of platform of knowledge and I think FIP is a, a key driver in this because it has such a, 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 a possibility of a, a joining all the associations and, uh, and, and leverage all the, the whole thing. So I'm very hopeful for the future uh, to be able to organize this. And also the, con the contacts we have with the uh, uh, experts in um, digital experts and uh, other association a consortium of softwares and so on. It's so important, all these contacts. So I'm quite hopeful for the future. It will take time. I, as we say in France, Paris has not been built in one day. So it is the same. Yes, thank you, Kat. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. It's a journey and it's a, it's a development and it always starts with a one step in the right direction. 
So I would like to thank all of you colleagues. Thank you, dear panelists, uh, dear co-moderators. What we are overwhelmingly aware of is that these challenges and opportunities are not solved in one digital event of 90 minutes. However, we can say that we are really living in exciting times. And we are also overwhelmed with all the work our experts have dedicated to develop their answers and time spent in advance for this event, as well as for their presentations. I think we have had such fantastic uh, presentations from all the panelists. And I would also like uh, all panelists to join me in thanking the FIP team for their support and for managing all these interactions. And of course, the speakers who have shared their experiences and expertise, how, navigate, how to navigate in this new landscape. And uh, the development is to be continued. So we do expect to meet you all again in the future. But I think we can agree on four trends perhaps affecting not only community pharmacy, but pharmacy on the whole, digitalization, automation, artificial intelligence, and perhaps machine learning, better use of data, more convenience and control for patients, because it's about all about convenience, both in the digital world and in the physical world, and pharmacy as the first port of call for healthcare. Because one of the biggest reasons we need to embrace tech and automata automation is to free up time for, for our colleagues. The more time they can save, the more time they can spend with patients and be that first point of contact for them. And this will allow us to be the first port of call for patient health and patient needs. And we mustn't forget that throughout the treatments and medication, the patient is the only point that connects all others. So we shouldn't forget about the, uh, this um, perspective as well, the patient. And I think that assortment price and fast delivery, delivery will not be sufficient in order to compete in the future because we already have a very strong competitive advantage in the heart of our communities. And as Jacqueline said, all of this gives me great hope for the future of pharmacy because as long as we retain our spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship, and as long as we never lose sight of the importance of the trusted relationship between pharmacists and patients, pharmacies can continue to grow and build on going forward with confidence by seeing technology as a tool to develop our services. So I wish you all good wishes and the best of luck in your endeavors. Thank you so very much, all of you for attending this digital event and we will run more events like this. And I hope to see you all again uh, in the future. So thank you all so very, very much and goodbye. <laughs>